gates can, do not block the exit. Either sit along the wall, do not block the lights, or come sit on the stage. Please do not block the exit. Thank you. Thank you and welcome here this evening. My name is Carlos Romero, I'm Associate Vice President for Research. That may not mean a lot to folks. Uh, I oversee areas of our research enterprise here at the University of New Mexico. And on behalf of uh, the University President Bob Frank and our campus community, I welcome you tonight to listen to our speaker, Dr. John Mather. Dr. Mather, along with his colleague, uh, Dr. George Smoot, shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006 for a truly fundamental discoveries about the origins of our universe. And you'll be hearing about those tonight and some of the new frontiers that he is uh, embarking on. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the students. I see a lot of our physics students here and students from other departments. Uh, welcome. We have high school students. You'll see high school students among us here. In fact, I was happy to host, along with uh, Dr. Mather before this event, an event with local high school students and science teachers where they had a really open and frank conversation about interests and exploring and life in science and life in having a true passion for figuring things out. Um, a little bit about UNM. You know, UNM is a multifaceted institution. We are what's considered a very high research university. And we do research in anything from education to healthcare to physics, chemistry, uh, natural sciences, astrophysics. And we address a lot of the societal problems, not only in New Mexico, but across the country. And in the hall you're in, in Keller Hall, we have great research and teaching going on in music and fine arts. So it makes our university a rich, rich campus. I'd like to introduce uh, Tony Hull, who is a professor in our physics department, and he's played an integral role in bringing Dr. Uh, Mather here tonight, and he also helped with the development of the James Webb Space Telescope mirrors, and is a local leader in the field of optical sciences, and we're happy that he is on our campus tonight. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Dr. Romero, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's wonderful having a crowd of so many enthusiastic people here to hear some really interesting things about science. Every now and then, one gets an opportunity to be an extraordinary person. Let me put this all in the context of NASA's next great observatory. <coughs> Several years ago, I was directing the optical fabrication of the mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and this will be this telescope will be the sequel to the Hubble, the next great observatory that uh, will give all sorts of fantastic discoveries. It's optimized to be the first telescope to see the first light, the first galaxies from the emerging universe. While I was doing this uh, in California, John Mather called and asked to see the fabrication of the mirrors by my team. He was delighted to see how the mirrors were being made, and we had a great conversation. Uh, this is when I first met him, and I've had the privilege to visit with him many times since. John is interested in every effort to make this extraordinary telescope, and he'll tell you you have to pay attention to every aspect of an important scientific asset like this. Uh, we should anticipate James Webb Space Telescope transforming astrophysics after its launch in 2018. John's accomplishments speak for themselves. His work leading to the 2006 Nobel Prize has cemented the Big Bang Theory and has helped bring forth cosmology, the understanding of the very nature of the universe, from theoretical consideration into a precision science. Tonight we learn from someone who has considered deeply both the history and future of the universe. Please welcome Dr. John Madden. tonight. Uh, I hope to tell you an abbreviated history of the universe. 
parts. Um, and, uh, but before I do that, I wanted to say just a couple words about how I got to be a scientist, because it seems to be that people want to know. Uh, so my parents started reading uh, books out loud to me and my sister when I was about eight. And, uh, and I remember they read to us uh, from biographies of Galileo and Darwin. So I concluded right away that it was really exciting, really important, and maybe dangerous. Because you might find things that people didn't want to hear. It was true in those days, and it's still a little bit true sometimes. But nevertheless, exciting and important. And the fact that people don't agree with you tells you that it's important. If they didn't care, it would be different. So uh, I want to tell you uh, something about the work that was described to us uh, by the introductions, uh, how, it, uh, how we found out about the expanding universe, uh, what we hope to do next and to learn more about our history. And I'll wrap up with a few thoughts about what's coming next for us and in the short term and in the extremely long term because I wanted to tell you about where we are going. And I don't know what I'm speculating. So uh, I'm going to start off with a few beautiful pictures taken with the great Hubble Space Telescope. So I don't know if we can lower the lights a little bit more um, safely, but um, this is a picture that took the Hubble Space Telescope two weeks to take. So what they did was uh, the director decided to point the telescope to a place where there was nothing to look at that they knew about. In other words, no stars, no galaxy clusters, no anything exciting. And what they found was that the whole sky is covered with little dots, little galaxies, uh, and uh, far more than people ever imagined were out there. So what's a galaxy? A galaxy is 100 billion stars, more or less like the sun, uh, orbiting a common center held together by gravity. And if you could take a picture of the entire sky in the way that Hubble did, there would be 100 billion galaxies out there. So 100 billion is a pretty large number. Um, and just for comparison, it's about the same number of neurons that you have in your mind, in your brain. So it's a huge number. Um, it's comprehensible, but not easy. So um, how did this get this way? Well, this uh, beautiful picture uh, has little dots on it. Uh, some are spiral galaxies, some are irregular galaxies. Uh, some are elliptical galaxies. Uh, we see them as they are now. Uh, we see them as they were a long time ago. Uh, we're able to look back in time at uh, when the universe was young and see them as they were when they were young. So that's uh, sort of the uh, astonishing message of this picture. And I must say that it was a huge surprise to astronomers that this is how the universe really is. Uh, when the Hubble Space Telescope was designed back in the 1970s, we, we were sure what it would see, and it wasn't anything like this. So. Be warned, we get surprises. So, uh, a few other beautiful Hubble pictures. This is called the Whirlpool Nebula. It is uh, taken uh, uh, of one of our nearest bright neighbor galaxies. Uh, it, uh, you can quite seriously, clearly see the spiral pattern that it has. It's uh, called the Whirlpool for obvious reasons. And, and, and you can see in the picture there are different colors showing up. Uh, different colors meaning different things happen in different parts of the galaxy. Uh, the blue regions are bright new stars that have just formed. The reddish regions are dusty regions where uh, things are about to happen. And there are black regions in there where the dust grains that are absorbing the starlight from, those beautiful, from this beautiful galaxy. And you can see it's got a neighbor galaxy that's about to hit. They're about to collide. So that'll be exciting. Here's a, another amazing picture from the Hubble. This is a star that exploded in AD 1054. And we know actually what exact day it did it. Uh, because the Chinese astronomers wrote it down and we still have their records. Other people wrote it down too. Uh, I think that there's a picture of it in, uh, in the petroglyphs nearby here. But I don't think we have the calendar exactly, but we know it's the same object. So it was visible in the daytime, it was so darn bright. Uh, it's in the constellation of Taurus, I think. Anyway, so what does this mean to us? Well, I'll tell you more later, but the fact that stars do explode occasionally is a really important part of our own history. So here's another bit. Uh, this is a mosaic uh, picture taken with a Hubble of the central star of the Sword of Orion. So when you look at the star of, Sorion, of Orion with binoculars, you see that this central star is just a little bit fuzzy. Here it is all spread out in beautiful colors, uh, and it's the, one of our favorite targets for all astronomers because something's always going on in there. It's a place where stars are being born as we speak. Uh, some are, born, are about to burn out. Probably some of them will explode, like that other one that I just showed you sometime in the not too distant future. So it's the nearest uh, location where a lot of this is happening, and it's very, very exciting for us. So now perhaps we may surprise many of you. Um, 
Uh, when you look in the mirror in the morning, uh, you can think about cosmology as well as cosmetology. <laughs> when you look in the mirror, you're looking at exploding stars. You are exploding stars. Your atoms have been traveling through the universe. Some of them have been all the way outside our galaxy and have fallen back down in. Uh, they came from atoms that, that were formed in that star, stars like that one that I showed you, um, because we know the early universe did not have the chemical elements of life. It was only hydrogen and helium after the first three minutes. So where did the rest come from? From stars like that that blew up. So uh, we are totally recycled. Our atoms have been traveling for perhaps hundreds of millions of light years before they turned around and turned back into a new generation of stars. So we've been recycled. It's okay. <laughs> So uh, you might say, well, how do you all know that? So uh, we have our methods, of course. Uh, number one is astronomers really can look back in time. We see things as they were when light was sent out. So I'm seeing you as you sent out light a few fractions of a microsecond ago. Uh, if you were to look at the uh, sun, you see it as it was 500 seconds ago when it sent light to us. Uh, the center of our galaxy takes 25,000 years to get light from there to here. If you could look all the way back to almost the beginning of time, uh, it's almost 15 billion uh, years. So this is an old chart. I've been showing the same chart for 30 years. <laughs> so the number has changed a little bit. It's 13.8 billion now. So, um, let's see. I'm going to have the top of my head. There we go. Um, no um, so uh, now I want to show you how do we know how far we're looking. Well, we know the speed of light, as we actually measure that right here in our lab. Um, so now let's go survey the universe. So we do it the way you would be taught in high school trigonometry. Uh, you draw triangles. If you know one side of a triangle and you know two angles of the triangle, and, and you know that uh, Euclid applies, then uh, you know the whole shape of the triangle, so now you can survey the universe. So um, we do this, uh, we start off by the fact that we can actually move our position a little bit, as the Earth spins, your head moves a little bit, because uh, the diameter of the Earth is 8,000 miles. We wait for a whole year, we, the Earth moves around the Sun, it's an orbit with a radius of 93 million miles. So uh, we can move our head back and forth, and you can see the world change out there. The stars appear to move back and forth. You can survey the universe that way. Uh, so that works uh, for a pretty good distance, but not all the way. So after that, the only method that we have left is, if something as far away as probably and fainter, it, then you can tell. So if, you, if I can tell you and promise you that I have these two objects out in the sky and they're identical, really, really identical, but one looks fainter, we say it's because it's farther away. So this is our other way of surveying, and it's really geometry also. So now we can survey the entire universe, no problem. Uh, but it's hard. So now you say, well, how about motion? How do we tell about the motion of the universe? Well, this is our next challenge. There are a few things uh, that you can clearly see are going to move across the sky. If you wait during the course of an evening, you can actually see that the moon is moving across in front of the stars. Just wait an hour, it's moved, you can tell. Um, if you uh, look at other things, the planets, you have to wait a few days before you can see with your eye that they've moved. Um, if you uh, look at the stars, you have to really work hard with a telescope to see that they moved. And after that, you can't tell. Um, so we have one other method, however, which is uh, something you can hear with your ears as you're driving down the freeway occasionally. Uh, if somebody's, uh, if you're driving along and you hear a motorcycle come up behind you, um, and then it goes past you, the pitch will change of the, that you hear from the engine of the motorcycle, and this is called the Doppler shift. We see a very similar effect with light waves. So we say, okay, how do we do that? Well, we spread out, for example, spread out the light of the sun with a, a prism, and you get a beautiful rainbow. If you do it very carefully with good optical equipment, you see that there are certain marks across the rainbow that come from atoms and molecules in the atmosphere of the sun. So, really important. Number one, that since the 19th century, we've been able to analyze the chemical constituents of the sun. In fact, we discovered an element in the sun that way. Uh, element helium was first found there. So that's why we call it helium. So um, anyway, now we can understand stars. We can figure out the chemistry and physics of stars. But now something else also happens. Uh, this, you know, this is like when the motorcycle is going by. It was the original pitch of the motorcycle. We now have something recorded by the atoms and molecules in every star to tell us what was the wavelength originally when it was produced. And now we go measure the wavelength and it's different. 
we say it's because the star is going away from us, we're coming toward us. But now we can measure the speeds of things toward us some and away. So this we've been able to do this for since the 19th century. Um, but now in the early 20th century, Edwin Hubble, uh, being a great astronomer, uh, was uh, beginning to perfect these techniques, and he made us this chart. So in 1929, this uh, came out, it was in the front page of every newspaper around the world, practically, um, this little bitty chart. So what does it show? Uh, on a, he's got galaxies on this chart. And it only shortly before that, then figured out that a galaxy is what I told you, hundreds of billions of stars orbiting around each other. Um, and now he was able to make a chart that says, you know, they're going away from us, most of them are. Um, and so on the horizontal direction, he's got the distance that he estimated, with the standard candle method that I showed you. On the vertical direction, how fast are they going away from us? So what you see here is that the farther away, the faster. Very simple trend that he's showing us. And if you divide the speed by the distance, you can figure out, sorry, divide the speed into the distance, you can figure out how long did it take for that to happen. Divide the speed by the distance, get the age of the universe. So 1929, we were forced into the fact that the universe is expanding. People did not expect this. Basically, there were two people in the world that did expect it, and Einstein said they were wrong. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, Edwin Hubble showed us. Um, so when people talk about the expanding universe theory or the Big Bang theory, you might think, oh, it's just astronomers put this up over here some night. No, we were forced into it, sorry. We didn't like it, people didn't like it. But that can't be right. Einstein was sure it couldn't be true, uh, but it is true. So. Then, however, we got into a little bit of a difficulty because Hubble's age for the universe is about two billion years. It didn't take us too long to find out that stars are older than that and the Earth is older than that. So there's a something troubling here. And it took us another uh, roughly 30 years to figure that out. So Hubble was wrong about the distance. Uh, distances are about seven times bigger than what he thought. And that's because the candles that he was comparing in his standard candle method were not really the same. He didn't have any way to know. Now we know, but it was hard to find out. So, okay, there's the, the, uh, the origin of the expanding universe story. So now I want to show you a surprise. Here's uh, three astronomers looking at each other, and they now imagine that they're drawing their Hubble chart here. So the one on the left says, I can do my Hubble chart, and I think uh, my universe is one hour old. I think our race started an hour ago. Now imagine what the uh, tortoise astronomer will say. Um, she will say, I think our race started an hour ago also. How about the one on the right looking over his shoulder? Um, he would also say, the universe started an hour ago, our race started an hour ago. Um, now, who's in the middle? Well, there's no grass in outer space. Nobody can tell who's moving and who's not moving. So everybody, and all these astronomers in outer space are saying, I'm in the middle. <coughs> So this is a really startling conclusion that we can get from the fact that Hubble's chart's a straight line. Mathematical conclusion. And uh, people are really surprised at this because almost everybody says, where was the Big Bang? Are you sure? Where was it? And this is because we're very confused about the name of the Big Bang. Uh, when uh, Edwin, when uh, Fred Hoyle gave us the name of the Big Bang, he was trying to make fun of the idea. And he's completely misled us now for half a century. Uh, because when you hear the Big Bang name, you think of a little bang. You think of a firecracker in the corner of the room, and then you want to know where it was. But what we actually see as astronomers is Hubble's chart. Everything's running away from us, and we feel like we're in the middle. And we calculate that everybody else will feel that they're in the middle, too. So this is the mystery um, of the expanding universe. And it's just something we're not familiar with, so we're, we're not used to it. But I've grown up with it, so it's OK with me. I want it to be okay with you. Let's let it be okay. That's what we saw. That's what we call it, the expanding universe. Let's not call it the Big Bang, even though there's a TV show. <laughs> so maybe you can excuse the fact that I cannot draw you a picture. Uh, I cannot stand outside the universe and draw a picture of the universe expanding from something. It's just not possible. The, meaning, the words don't mean anything to us. So uh, I can't draw you a picture. That's all right. And. Uh, it's the wrong name, like I said. So now you could be saying, well, uh, our solar system is not expanding, nothing about the Earth is expanding. How come we didn't find this out before? And that's because it's not. 
So you have to look out to cosmic distances to find out about it. So now you could say, well, uh, suppose the universe is expanding like you guys say. Uh, how did we get here that is not? So the idea that we have is gravitation reaching across huge expanses of space is able to say, well, let's uh, slow down the expansion. And, and it turns out that if the early stuff wasn't exactly uniform but had denser spots in it, those parts could stop expanding and collapse back down to make galaxies. So the prediction, which is a pretty serious one, is there has to be something original in the way that early universe is set up by whatever did that, um, that is not the same everywhere. And so then gravity can start, turn around the expansion, make galaxies, stars, and people. So we have to find this or the whole story is off. So naturally I'm going to tell you we found it, but I'll show you that in a bit. Um, then after, of course, the stars exist, uh, then they can make the chemical elements of life, and we can have all the wonderful complexity of life here on Earth, um, and uh, the, 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 uh, the non-organic complexity like tornadoes and hurricanes and other amazing things that we have. So, anyway, uh, we don't know how to think about it. People are still thinking about how did that work, but this is the basic idea I'm offering you. The gravitation reaching across space was able to stop the expansion in places, turn it around and make stars and galaxies and us. So I want to now illustrate a few things that people think about the history of the Earth, which is a bit surprising to almost everybody. Um, we, number one, we have the age of the Earth quite precise. It turns out to be very nearly one-third the age of the universe. So we are youngsters. Uh, our atoms probably have been around a long time before they turned into the Sun and the Earth. So um, it's a bit of a surprise. Uh, also, and then you might say, well, how do you know the age of the Earth? Well, we go around and pick up little dust grains and rocks and find the oldest things in them and say, well, that looks pretty old, how old is it? And we do uh, isotope analysis. Uranium breaks down into makes lead, and you can figure this out as you work really hard. So um, we know the age of the solar system that way. Uh, then we say, uh, well, what was the early solar system like? And we've been thinking about that. We think we got a big moon out there, which is unique in the solar system, because something crashed into the Earth. Something about the size of Mars came crashing in. We've given it a name. We call it Thea. Um, that has a great name, and I don't remember the history of Thea. Who she was? Anyway, I guess I'm glad that it happened because here we are. So uh, then we have an idea that the, um, and we actually have measurements that say the Earth was bombarded with rocks for hundreds of millions of years, and uh, possibly with comets that brought in the water that made the oceans. So how did that happen? I have, we have a story to show you, which uh, basically is that the solar system has been chaotic at times. So here is a movie of the way the uh, four giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, uh, were in orbit around the sun for hundreds of millions of years. This is a computer-generated uh, simulation. So in the middle are the four big planets, and then the little green things around the outside are the comets and asteroids that were left over that uh, we think might have uh, just failed to form into a planet or something. So what the movie shows is it keeps on running around more or less like clockwork for hundreds of millions of years, and then as you watch, it will do something different. So that could have been us. Uh, what would have happened for hundreds of millions of years is the little green rocks flying around would have bombarded the Earth could have brought the uh, water into us from outside, and that may be where we got the oceans. And we know about the craters on, that happened because they're all over the moon, and you can find the dates of the craters on the moon. So this story does sort of hang together. Not that it's true, but it at least hangs together. So that's part of how we got here. Now I want to step back a little farther back in time to show you uh, the work that uh, got us our Nobel Prizes. So uh, here is a sketch of the satellite that we built. Uh, it followed um, a sketch that was made on a whiteboard, or actually might have even been a, bef before that. We might have actually used chalk. Uh, back in 1974, we sketched this thing up. And uh, we ended up building it about the same way that we drew it, which is kind of remarkable. Um, anyway, what it is, is it a satellite around the Earth. It has instruments in it to measure the cosmic heat of that, those first moments of the universe. Uh, so the cosmic heat is available to us today because it still fills the universe. It's pretty darn bright. If you put out a square meter of collector, you get three microwatts of power from the early universe. 
can't use it for anything, but it's there and you can measure it. So our job was to measure it really, really well, see if this story is correct. So the uh, apparatus could measure the spectrum and also make a map, and I'll show you what we got. So I think the thing is still up there. Nobody's told me that it fell down yet. Uh, but we launched it 15, 20, let's see, we launched 15 years later in 1989, and it functioned uh, right away. So within about six weeks, I showed this chart to the American Astronomical Society, and they gave us a standing ovation for a chart. <laughs> so now I have to tell you what it means. Um, the uh, smooth curve on that picture is the what we call the spectrum. How bright is this cosmic heat at each different frequency? How many waves per centimeter are there? And so the brightness is on the vertical direction and the waves per centimeter on the horizontal direction. And the measurements are the little boxes and they're all right on the curve. So that, then the curve is the prediction of the expanding universe theory. So we got the standing O because the theory was safe after all. So if it hadn't been like that, we wouldn't have had a clue what to do. Uh, so I guess it's good that it turned out that way. Um, eventually, we improved the measurements, and the uh, error bars are so small you can't plow them. They're 50 parts per million. So we, uh, we, I've been showing this plot now for a long time, uh, and it uh, made us pretty good and pretty famous. Uh, now I want to show you the next one that we got, though, two years later. Uh, this one was the one that we showed. Uh, the, and the one to think about is the one in the lower right-hand corner. It's an oval, which is basically a map of the entire sky. It's a map of how bright is this cosmic heat in every direction. So uh, it's not the same in every direction. And basically, the early universe has bumps. Just the way I said it had to have for us to exist, if gravity is going to stop the expansion and turn it around and make galaxies, stars, and people. So uh, when Stephen Hawking saw this picture, he said it was the most important scientific discovery of the century if not of all time. So, I guess it was important. <laughs> um, and I didn't fully appreciate when he said it, why he said it. So I've tried to explain to you why it was important uh, that we wouldn't be here without it. Uh, and of course it has another theoretical physics implication, which is you know, we have to explain that. And so it tells us about the properties of whatever was there in the earliest moments of the expanding universe, quantum mechanical fluctuations of space-time, or quantum gravity, or whatever it might have been. And we're still working on that, and we're not going to have a final answer for a long time, if ever. Uh, but anyway, that's the challenge, is to explain that picture, and now to use it to uh, understand how come we're here. So there's a long step to, uh, from there to here, but I want to show you what we're currently working on with our new telescope that uh, has been mentioned as the next big thing after Hubble. So, um, naturally, uh, after the Hubble telescope was launched, and I guess almost everybody here knows that it was launched and it was not in focus, a uh, major, major, major disaster for NASA, uh, about the worst thing you could imagine ever happening to us, except killing people. Um, so, uh, but brave astronauts went up, and uh, really, really creative engineers figured out what they should do, and they fixed it. And so, uh, five years after the the uh, shuttle uh, launched the Hubble Space Telescope, and by the way, it's going to be 25 years old next spring. Uh, five years after the launch, uh, there was a committee formed to say, what are we going to do next? Hubble is working beautifully, uh, but it isn't going to answer every question. So what is the next question? So the committee wrote a beautiful report, it's very poetic, and they said, do two things. Number one, build an infrared telescope, that is to say, measure longer wavelengths than what the Hubble can see. And number two, start developing the methods to study Earth-like planets, if there are any, around other stars. We didn't know if there would be any, but there was a hope that there would be. Today, I guess you all know there are a lot of them out there, and we'll come back to it. Anyway, so we've been doing both. So here is the, uh, the reason why we're doing it. So number one, if you want to study the first galaxies that formed, uh, the expanding universe has stretched out their wavelengths of light, so they're now infrared. So build an infrared telescope to see those. And then when you've built one, and then what else can you do with it? You can see that the universe is totally different when you use infrared light to see with. So here are a few infrared pictures just to show you that you can measure the temperatures of things, um, and you can just learn a lot. Um, for instance, um, Earth emits a lot of infrared heat. Each one of us is transmitting 500 watts of infrared power. And we don't feel it, we don't get cold, because we're getting like 490 watts back from the room around us. So we're not freezing to death in a flash. Uh, 
just for comparison, I'll tell you how we're building this telescope, but um, if we put a bumblebee at the distance of the moon, we would be able to pick up the heat that bumblebee sends out. So that's why we needed to build a new telescope to explore new things. And here's what it looks like. This telescope doesn't look anything like any other telescope we've ever built. Um, it has some really wild features about it. Uh, number one, you see this big uh, golden hexagon up there, which is made of uh, 18 smaller hexagons. And uh, that's, the, that's the big mirror that collects the starlight and the galaxy light and focuses it down. The other big thing that you see there is a big blue sheet underneath it, which is a huge umbrella. It's about as big as a tennis court. And that keeps the sun from ever shining on the telescope so it can be cold. So why do we need the telescope to be cold? So it doesn't transmit infrared power like we do. If we want to see the bumblebee out there, we have to make the telescope a lot colder. So that's why the basic story of the telescope is it looks totally different from any other we've ever had. So who's building the telescope? Uh, NASA, where I work, is leading the project. Uh, and we have a partnership with both the European and Canadian space agencies. They are chipping in big chunks of their science budget to make this happen. And the Europeans are even buying the rocket uh, for us, which will go up from French Guiana in 2018. Four years from today, we should be at the launch site, or maybe we will already push the button by that day. So uh, that's our plan. Uh, the project is uh, mostly in the US. Uh, we have contracts with people all around the country to do stuff, but the big one is with Northrop Grumman Corporation uh, in California. So we get on the airplane a lot and fly to LA. So uh, what else do I need to tell you about this one? Oh, the telescope is supposed to run for 10 years. We're guaranteeing five. So this will be busy for a long time. Uh, let's see. This is a, an illustration of how it's supposed to get up there. A little bit. Uh, the telescope is bigger than the rocket. So it is going to be folded up, kind of origami project, uh, to get it in there. Uh, it's done very carefully, and there's hardly any space left. Uh, you can see the. Uh, folded up telescope in the right hand picture there. Clearance is just a few inches around the outside. The unfolded one you see on the left, you see that it is a uh, uh, side view and you can see the big concave reflector and you can see the side view of the sun shield with the umbrella which actually has five layers of plastic to, uh, to have it really be a good protector. Um, we'll come back to it, but the orbit is not where the Hubble is. The Hubble Space Telescope is just a few hundred miles above the Earth uh, this one is going to be a billion miles away, so we cannot get there from here with people, I'm sorry. Uh, we better get it right the first time, we know that. Uh, but we've been testing a lot, so here are some of the mirrors that Tony uh, was working on. Um, they um, are actually in the test chamber at Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Um, and uh, of course they're there because we were able to test them at the low temperature that they will have in space. You know, in space. They look like gold in this picture, because they have been coated with gold, but it actually takes an extremely tiny amount of gold, like the amount that's in my ring here, to coat each one of those. The real material that's under them is beryllium, which is element number four in the periodic table, and we chose that because it behaves properly at low temperature. So we're getting along pretty well with our project. Uh, it's taken us 19 years to get to today, uh, but now we're very proud of ourselves because things are finishing up. This is the team of people in our clean room at Goddard Space Flight Center. So you cannot recognize them because they're all wearing their bunny suits. Uh, we wear these clean suits to keep dust from human beings to get onto the, onto the, uh, the equipment. Because we can't clean it. You don't, cannot run your vacuum cleaner across the optical system after you've made it. So um, anyway, there they are. They have finished putting together the instrument module, which contains all the cameras and spectrometers and things that make the rainbows out of them. So they uh, have just finished a test. We put the, uh, the, uh, the whole package into our giant vacuum tank at Goddard. We said, yeah, it's going to work right. And so we simulated operation in outer space. And we're really happy with it. We've got lots of small errors, no big ones. So we know what to do, and we're right on track for that. You might say, well, how do you know you're, how are you going to focus this telescope? Everybody knows the Hubble telescope was not in focus. So we're actually going to focus it after launch on purpose. Uh, so how are you going to do that? Well, you have to practice. So we built a little one on this big, uh, one-sixth scale. And so we practiced up uh, moving all the little mirrors around with motors. So that's all done after launch. 
Um, then how do you know that and that's really going to work? We have to practice up full scale. So there's a truly gigantic vacuum tank in uh, Houston at Johnson Space Flight Center, which is uh, about 120, 120 feet tall, 65 feet in diameter. You can cool it down to the operating temperature. And so uh, that's been completed and it works. By the way, it's a very ancient vacuum tank that was used by the Apollo astronauts to practice getting out of their, van, out of their spaceship under the surface of the moon before we went back in 1969. So it's on the historic register. I have to go to the park service and tell them you want to change the historic thing before you can do it. Of course they said yes. So now I want to show you a little bit of the engineering that goes into this. Um, here we have a movie taken of the unfolding, practice unfolding of the telescope. So let's see, what are we doing here? Um, there's this big hingy thing that has to properly work. So the uh, telescope will fold up and unfold. Um, so we practiced it. So it's been speeded up a lot. It'll take a long time to really do in outer space, but it's done by remote control. All these people are here to make sure that we notice if anything's going wrong. So it worked. We got that. We also have to practice unfolding the sun shield, this uh, thing that's as big as a tennis court. So this was something that actually happened over the course of several days in actual flight. Um, here are the people running around again to make sure nothing <laughs> escapes notice, nothing snags, nothing uh, catches on anything. It's tricky, but you can see that they're working hard. <laughs> and, uh, recording it all with cameras, <laughs> so that uh, if we uh, think of something afterwards that we didn't notice, we can say, you yeah, know, I saw that the camera caught it. So this is one of the reasons these projects are hard. We have to make sure that it's going to work.
So now I'm going to illustrate uh, what we are hoping to find out. So um, now we have uh, measurements of what the early universe was like. We can say, well, what if that's true? Can we simulate uh, how we got here? So, uh, yeah, sort of. Um, imagine that you have the giant weather computer, and you say, what was the weather like yesterday? Let's see what it will be like today, tomorrow, and, and the day after. So we can do that with the universe. So take what you think the universe was like in the earliest times, now let the computer simulate the growth of galaxies. So what this is, is I told you earlier that gravitation reaching across space can stop the expansion and pull stuff together. So the simulation says yes, gravity really will do that. So over the course of billions of years, uh, first the galaxies begin to form, they, they begin to collide and merge together. After a few more billion years, the things start to go boom in the middle. Uh, let's see if one is happening yet. See the red thing there? That's a galaxy with a um, black hole in the middle, beginning to uh, swallow stuff up and produce immense amounts of energy. These are called active galactic nuclei. So uh, galaxies are uh, suddenly becoming extremely complex. And at this point in the history of the universe, the Sun and Earth do not yet exist but the atoms that we're made of are being produced in these exploding stars. So is this true? I don't know. Our job is to measure. We have to go take pictures of the early universe and see if they match the movie. But we cannot actually make the movie from what we see. We only can get snapshots. But we can use the computer to help us interpret the snapshots. And if we can't get them to match, then we know we didn't win yet. So in a, a few decades, we should be able to say if this movie or some somewhat better movie is correct or not. So by the way, this movie requires uh, something that astronomers know is there and nobody else can see, which is called dark matter. Dark matter has gravity and it's essential to the formation of us, our Berlin galaxy, but nobody else can tell it's there. So it's still a big mystery. So this is about the time that the solar system has been formed and the uh, universe is starting to quiet down a little bit. Not so many explosions. And there's the universe as more or less the simulated universe as it is today. All formed by gravity, so they say. So that's what made it. <laughs> so now I want to show you. Uh, let's see if we we'll can. The next movie we'll play. Um, something that is probably in our history. I mean, in our future. Come on, movie. Yep. Um, you know that beautiful Andromeda Nebula, that one that everybody sees in pictures, that you can see with binoculars uh, on a nice dark night? It's coming toward us. And it's going to hit us in about 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion years, more or less head on. So we can simulate that too with a computer. This is what it might look like uh, from outside. Now to simulate what it would look like from the inside, that's a whole other story. And uh, future astronomers will have a wonderful view. <coughs> so what happens when galaxies collide? Well, most of the stars go right past each other. They do not hit each other. Uh, so the solar system uh, will probably pass through more or less intact, whatever it's like at that time. Uh, this, the planets will still be attached to the sun. But look at this totally astonishing thing that they will be witnessing at that time. And in the end, it looks like it's making a new black hole in the middle. And that's pretty spectacular, too. So that could happen. Does this happen? Probably. Uh, we sort of know it does because we see other galaxies doing it. So uh, this is probably not just a speculation. So closer to home, what are we going to see? We'll see places like this. This is a place, uh, one of our most beautiful NASA pictures. It's called the Eagle Nebula. Uh, and it's a place where stars are being born today, like they are in, uh, uh, in uh, the sword, in the nebula in the sword of Orion. Um, but it's beautiful, and you, it's also frustrating. Do you see how dark those columns of dust are? You cannot see inside. We know that's where the stars are being born as we speak. But you know what? If you could use an infrared telescope, you can see through the dust. 
So this is what we get when we use an infrared telescope on the ground. So yes, indeed, you can see through the dust cloud, see the stars inside. So this is an example of how we hope to learn how the sun was formed. To look inside the dusty clouds, voice like suns, stars like the sun are being born as we speak. Closer to home, we'd like to know well, how about planets? Are they like the Earth being formed now? Um, so we can get pictures of planets with some great work. Uh, with extremely clever people on the ground, we can take pictures of planets orbiting other stars. We have to suppress the uh, shimmering atmosphere of the Earth and make it better. Um, and, but it's even better if you can go into space. The picture on the lower right is the first time we've ever detected a planet uh, by, from taking a picture and knowing where to, where to look and seeing it and take its picture. So the one on the lower right was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. We saw this uh, cloud of dust orbiting around a star. We said there has to be a planet there, and sure enough, it was there. So it's the first time since we discovered Neptune that we could do that. Now this planet that they've seen here is actually huge, uh, much bigger than Earth, so it's, we're not yet able to see an Earth-like planet that way. But we can find Earth-like planets this way. And it's been done. Uh, the Kepler Observatory has already done this. Okay, I'm not sure you saw the left-hand movie. Uh, the, but what happens is um, a planet orbiting a star can go between our telescope and the star and block out some of the starlight. And um, there we know that the planet went there. So if it happens again uh, three months later, and three months later, and three months later, we say we're sure of it. So uh, we can detect planets around other stars by this method, and we already have several thousand in the catalog of pretty good planet candidates. And some of them are a lot like Earth. They're about the right size and about the right temperature. So we do more or less know what to do to find out more about them. And, and uh, especially one really important trick. Some of the uh, starlight goes through the planetary atmosphere on its way to the telescope. You can analyze that and spread out the rainbow, like I told you, with the sun, uh, and find out the chemical constituents of the atmosphere of that planet. So if it's like Earth, we might be able to know. So uh, at least with a web telescope, we should be able to tell if an Earth-like planet out there has water enough to have an ocean. So um, in a decade, you might hear this. We hope to tell you soon. So, so that's sort of the summary of uh, the sort of basic science uh, case for the web telescope, what people are going to do, do with it uh, after we get it launched. Uh, if you're an astronomer, by the way, this is a good time to be thinking about writing your proposals. Uh, you have to write your proposal, you have to send it to a committee. The committee will probably vote you down because it's very uh, competitive. But you might be lucky and give you data and, and help you do it. So, but a few more words about uh, how would you find out if that planet out there is like Earth? There are a lot of things you'd like to know. Does it spin like Earth? Is it the right temperature? Is it the right size? Does it have the right amount of gravity? Is it wet? Does it have clouds? Um, does it have uh, a, a day that's about the length of our day, more or less 24 hours? Does it have a big moon? A lot of people think that the moon that we have is essential to the fact that we have life here um, because of the things that we know that it does. So, um, well, can you tell? Maybe you could tell from a distance. And finally, does it have the chemical constituents that, that we have in our atmosphere? Oxygen, which comes from life, um, that would be a pretty good sign. And some other things that would tell you that it's like Earth. So, in the long run, that's what we'd like to know about other planets around other stars, and of course, uh, needless to say, astronomers are thinking, what does that next telescope have to be like? So the one that I've just showed you is extremely difficult to build, but we have in mind something that's two or three times bigger, and it's more difficult to build, uh, but probably worth it. We just haven't figured out how to do it yet. So to wrap up with a little speculation about what's coming into the future, uh, what is? Well, here are some ideas. Um, in the next few hundred years, um, we are going to continue doing what we're doing, I think. People are burning up the coal, gas, and oil as fast as we can. In fact, uh, despite complaints about it, we're doing it faster every year. So uh, you can sort of tell we're going to do that. Um, we might, however, change our mind if somebody can come up and say, oh, I've got a better energy source for you, why don't you use this? It's cheaper than coal, oil, and gas. Then we would instantly switch. It hasn't been found yet, but we could find it. Um, eventually, the, we know the sea is coming up, so eventually, if we live long enough, New Jersey, Florida, Louisiana, maybe ocean. 
somebody said, but you go fishing in New Jersey in the middle. I don't know what we're going to do in those days. I think some people won't like that. People in Siberia might say, gee, it's nice that it's warm up here now. Um, so people will argue. I think we will argue because we always do. Um, in the very long term, however, there are a few other things we can be sure of that are not under our control. Uh, and we cannot be blamed one way or the other. Uh, we uh, pretty well know that the sun is getting brighter with time. And in about a billion years, it will be a lot hotter here regardless. And nothing we can do. We better have space travel by then, or our descendants will be too hot. Uh, so I don't know how we're going to do it, but we better do it. Uh, in a few more billion years, the uh, the collision that I showed you is going to happen between the galaxy, our Milky Way, and the, and, the, uh, and the Andromeda Nebula. Then sometime around that also, um, the sun is going to turn into a red giant star, which means that it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and cooler and uh, extremely bright, and it'll definitely be too hot here. Um, and uh, then after that, it uh, shrinks down to a star the size of the Earth, called the White Dwarf Star. And so the sun will be a lot fainter, and so if there's life around it, they better move back in closer if they can. So I don't know how they're going to do it, uh, but that's what they're, they're going to need to do that. Really, 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 really long term, the universe is going to probably continue to expand, um, and the stars will go out. That's what we are guessing. But we don't know. Uh, there might be a reset button that we don't know about. And we can't find out, not unless we wait a long time. So other people say, well, how far can we really go? I told you what we needed to have space travel so we don't all die in a billion years. And so, well, how far can we go? Well, I don't know. But I would say um, people are working as hard as they can to build robots. And they're already drilling the bottom of the ocean and uh, uh, mining the coal for us and doing a lot of other things. Um, if I had a gizzard, I could have my gizzard removed by a robot. Um, I don't have a gizzard. <laughs> So people are working really, really hard on artificial intelligence, uh, robotic stuff, and I don't know how far they can get, but I wouldn't bet against them. So I think we're going to have some pretty amazing uh, technology in that area, which means uh, long, long, long term, um, the robots could decide that they want to go to another star and uh, maybe look for life over there, and they might decide that they'd like to take us with them. I don't know what they would want to do at that point or whether we want to go with them. We might say, I don't trust that robot. <laughs> uh, anyway, it would be interesting. So, uh, um, unfortunately, uh, we are not getting any hints really about uh, um, warp drive or any of those other things that are needed for science fiction to really be true. Um, but maybe we will, I don't know. So we don't have any, we don't have antimatter drive, we don't have in infinite improbability drive, we don't have all the other things. <laughs> people have been writing about, but I'm not betting against that either. So let me wrap up and say there are lots of ways to learn more about all these things. There's a little paperback book I did some years back and lots of websites you can look at. Um, so I think we'll wrap up and I have time for some questions. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you. things. We do this a lot. 
and we beat him up a lot. But anyway, uh, so now, but now the, the mirrors that he was in charge of are finished, and as far as I can tell, they're perfect. So that part works. So um, then you have to test and test and test and test. So that's why we have these giant vacuum tanks. And eventually you get to where you can't possibly test it the real way. We can't test in zero gravity. Uh, we just know we, we can't do that. So we have to argue and think and imagine all the ways that something could possibly go wrong. And then try to say, I your boss, I proved to you this is why that should work. And, uh, we also have an elaborate process of looking for something called a, a single point failures. Suppose that one widget over there would die. Would the telescope be over or not? So we made a rule that there can't be any like that. There has to be always two ways to do everything. So and there's always an, ex always an exception to that, too. But that's what we have to go through, and it's what basically all space missions have to go through. And so that's how we get there, and why they usually work. But to tell you the truth, we all worry. Anyway, that's a good question. So there, okay. Uh, the event to show where the solar system went into disarray. What was it called? How long ago did it happen? And where can I find out more? Okay. And so the question about the solar system going into disarray. What was it called? Um, I think it's called the Nice model because Nice is a town in France where people got together to meet about this thing. Um, and so it's not a new idea. It's many years old by now. Um, so, if you look up um, the um, late heavy bombardment, that's the name we give to the fact that the Earth was hit many times by meteors for a long time. The late heavy bombardment will tell you. So, I think there are web pages in the Wikipedia. Wikipedia is really good about this stuff, by the way. I, I look there. <laughs> just enough better than what was done before so they can answer a new question. They also have to get a bigger, better computer every now and then because um, the old ones just weren't up to the job. So uh, we can burn up more com computer time than anybody with this kind of problem. So, the first time we had to solve those kinds of equations, by the way, was uh, done not so far away from here when we had to figure out nuclear explosions. So uh, the, cent, uh, the, the, uh, the, the computer code has a long history, and that was the first hardest problem that we had to solve with it. So, questions on this side? Um, you said that you can guarantee five years and hopefully ten years for the life of the telescope. I'm curious as to what the sort of limiting factor is. Are waiting, fuel, uh, wear around the device? Okay, so his question is, since I said we were planning for ten years of life and guaranteeing five, what would wear out, basically? So what we uh, use up is fuel. Uh, it takes a little bit of fuel, not very much, to, uh, to point the telescope from time to time, and also to uh, maintain the orbit. The orbit that we're in is actually not stable. So uh, the acceleration that we need is extremely small. A few meters per second per year is a uh, in, in, in number. So it takes a few hundred pounds of fuel to do that. But eventually, we'll use it up. So then the mission will be over. We'll have to send the telescope out so it never comes home. We don't want it falling on New York. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, from the tortoise and the hare and the human example, uh, the linear, the expansion was linear. Um, is that linear in time also? Oh, so his question is, uh, is the expansion that I showed you about the tortoise and the hare, is the expansion linear in time as well as in space? So. Um, Basically, what I showed you is that the uh, rate of expansion was a constant that they saw. One, uh, one hour per kilometer per, one kilometer per hour per hour in the tortoise example. So, you can also ask, well, is the universe expanding at the same rate for all time, or is it change? And is that your question? Yes. So, the answer is it has been changing. At first, it was a lot faster. Then it slowed down because gravity slowed it down. 
And then for the last five billion years, it's been speeding up, which is a huge surprise. So um, we cover our ignorance and we say it's dark energy. We <laughs> <laughs> do not have a clue. But curiously enough, Einstein left his spot in his equations for that behavior. And um, now we found it. But we don't know if it's because he put the number there that it's okay, or if there's something mysterious about the universe. So ask again in another century. <laughs> because we have no way to measure that, that in the lab at all. So question over here. Would you like to speculate on what that dark matter and that dark energy is? Would I like to speculate on what the dark matter and dark energy are? Um, not really. <laughs> or thousands of theories about the dark matter. And we actually have a hope of seeing some do something in the lab someday and we'll know something. Maybe, maybe they'll make some over there at the Hedron Collider in Europe. Maybe uh, a lab, uh, maybe a natural one will come do something in our detector in the lab somewhere. <coughs> um, then we might know something more about it. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's virtually no hope of doing anything like that about dark energy. All we can do right now that we know of is to see how has it depended on time. Was it always the same number, like Einstein's constant, or has that so-called constant actually changed as well? So there's only so far you can do that. So that's one of our current challenges, one of the top challenges in astronomy. And when we get done with it, I probably will still say I don't know. <laughs> that seems to be my refrain, I don't know. <laughs> but it's one of the fun parts about, it, about science. We're always working on the part we don't know. It's not about how much we do know, it's about what we don't know, what we could work on today. So let's see, you know, way up in the back. Here we go. Is the background radiation that was discovered considered a constant, or is it decreasing with time? Was it louder, if you will, in the past? So she's asking about this background radiation. Is it uh, decreasing with time? And we calculate that it is. Um, we say that the temperature of it should be inversely proportional to the apparent size of the universe. So in other words, if we wait uh, uh, about 10 years, it should go down by a part, about a part in a billion, so which we would never notice. Uh, so, but it was hotter in the past, and we can actually look at, uh, at galaxies as they were when the universe was much younger, and we can measure that this background radiation was hotter then. Quite remarkable. You can tell it was. So uh, yes, the, as the universe expands, it gets cooler. And by the way, I should emphasize that we didn't discover that radiation. Uh, another team did back in 1965. So we're celebrating uh, already the 50th anniversary of the discovery of that radiation. Remarkable. It was a big surprise. Okay. Some people at Princeton were looking for the radiation and then they got beaten by another team that had found it but didn't know what they had. So those guys got the Nobel Prize, as it turned out. So um, is there a multiverse? Is this the only one? Uh, we have probably no way to tell, um, experimentally. Someday somebody may say, here's this mathematical description, it fits everything we know, you should believe it. But, I don't think I would. <laughs> uh, I think there could very well be multiple universes out there that we'll never know about. Right. Because um, so many of the mathematical theories say that's natural. Um, but I don't know. I'm, a, I'm, I'm an instrument builder. I don't create universes. <laughs> so, okay. 
I've seen it a few times. It's really silly, but it's fun. <laughs> People are looking even stupider than we are, right? <laughs> so, okay. The use of beryllium and gold, what was the reason for that? And are there any predicted reactions once it gets in space? Uh, so beryllium and gold and why and reactions. So we, made, we decided to make the mirrors out of beryllium because um, it behaves well when it cools down. Uh, the important thing is it shouldn't warp and twist. It's all right if it shrinks, but it cannot warp and twist and lose its shape. So beryllium uh, has been developed very highly by metallurgists for a long, long time. So that was brilliant, so we used that. Uh, the gold coating is because it's the best reflector for infrared light. So it's good that it's cheap, gold. <laughs> brilliant is hard to The giant pain in the neck to work with it. Uh, partly because uh, the powders are bad for you. You can become seriously ill. So it's all done very carefully in sealed chambers and all that. So um, we just have time for a few more questions, I think. Some behind us. You seem to suggest that some light forms are more reactive than others. Is that correct?